medicines and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. bow your head with me. We'll start in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege that we have to come and worship you. Lord, that we have the Bible so readily available for us at our fingertips any time of the day. Lord, help us to study your word, to memorize scripture, to hide it in our hearts so that we not, not sin against you. And help us, Lord, to look at our own selves before we do point fingers at others, Lord, and look at the sins that we have in our life. And Lord, where we are falling short, Lord, help us to cry out to Jesus to, to bring us closer to the, the, what He is like, Lord, to, to, that the Word made flesh and dwelt among us, that the Spirit is transforming us, that we're walking in step with the Spirit to be like Jesus in this world, to realize that our life is not our own, but it was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that He gave up heaven and He lived a humble life here of, of ridicule and scorn and then died on the cross to save us from our sins. Lord, help us to realize also that Jesus said that he'll never forsake us or anything, that he's there advocating for us and that the Spirit is walking with us each step of the way. Lord, help us to hear what the Spirit has to, to say to the church, Lord, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Lord, do we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're moving on in Luke, and we're not going to Luke chapter 9 yet, even though that's where Mark read from, because I want to set you up what's next in the story. And after that comes the feeding of the 5,000. And if you've read John's account, it's a lot more extensive. You know that at that point in time when Jesus said, most of you here just want physical bread for your physical needs, but I am the bread of life. And whoever eats me will live. But many, 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 including disciples, walked away from Jesus that day and said, these teachings are too hard. It's no different today in the church. There are plenty that want to have an association with Jesus. We live in a time where, where that's not a good thing to say necessarily, but people still do because they look at our hypocrisy rather than our love. They look at our judgmentalism. They look at us and they don't see Jesus Christ in this world. I want you to look at yourself and see how much you see Jesus in your life because what's coming up in Luke's gospel where he's wrote this orderly account is when we get to Luke chapter 9, he sends them out. He sends them out on mission. And that's what I guess I'm trying to say a little bit from my standpoint on, on pastors coming together to address this issue by preaching the truth against this issue. That day that the woman was caught in the act of adultery, and we don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand, what were the Pharisees doing the day before that day? I mean, from what we discover in Scripture, they were probably tithing down to the least of their mint and everything else, but they were neglecting mercy and grace. They were neglecting the poor and the needy and the widows and so forth. But boy, they could come together to point fingers, couldn't they? What are you doing in your life to present the gospel message to others in a loving, kind way by the way you live? Like 1 Peter 3.15 says that we live such good, holy lives that then when they come to us, we tell them about the hope that we have, but we do it with kindness and gentleness. Is your life a living testimony to Jesus Christ? Now let me take you back a little bit. We went in that boat ride across the sea and the question was, who is this man that commands even the winds and the waves? And they obey and they were scared, worse than they were when the storm came up. And these were experienced sailors. Then they had to sail through the rest of the night and they'd come up to the shore and the first thing they'd meet is two demon-possessed, naked, crazy men. What do you first want to do with your thoughts as a human being? I don't want any association with these kind of people. Right? <laughs> but Jesus went on mission to see this man. 
to set him free and to leave him behind in that foreign territory to be the one light that reached out on that side of the lake. Would you do that? Though none go with me, will you still follow? What do you think happened to the legion of demons after they went into the pigs and the pigs drowned? You ever think about that? They begged Jesus not to send him out of the land. Jesus didn't say he would or wouldn't. They begged him not to send him to the abyss. Jesus didn't say he would or wouldn't. But probably he didn't do either one of those at that time. He just sent them into the pigs. The pigs went crazy and the pigs drowned. What happens to the demons after that? They didn't drown. You ever think about that? So not only did the man have to stay in the foreign land where he was at, he still had the same demonic activity. And now that he was set free, that demonic activity is going to roam elsewhere and try to find other people. The very people that he is supposed to be professing what Jesus Christ has done for him. Boy, he entered into a world of hurt, did he not? Staying on that side of the lake. Going to the people that had, he had once lived with, but they said, no, we cast you aside because we don't want your kind around here. We don't know what to do with you. And he had to go back and live and preach and testify to them. And Jesus was gone from that side of the lake. No power of the Holy Spirit come upon him yet. To me, that's just amazing. And then Jesus gets back in the boat, and we've got this travel back. We don't know what happens back across the lake, but we know when we get to the other side of the lake, there are such crowds again gathered to be associated with Jesus because of what he can do for them. Why do you associate yourself with Jesus? Do you associate yourself with Jesus so you can take up your cross and follow after him? Or do you associate yourself with Jesus because you grew up in church, because you want to be moral? Or did you associate with Jesus because you say, I'm willing to die for this gospel message? I hope you don't love pigs more than you love mankind. How did the man stay on the other side of the lake? You've got to go back to what Luke talked about when the woman fell at Jesus' feet. He knew what he had been forgiven from, that he, what he had been released from. And even though he begged Jesus to go with him, he was satisfied with staying where he was until the time came when he would meet Jesus again face to face. And he didn't have any of the Jewish faith. He didn't have the Bible. He didn't have anything else. All he had was the fact that Jesus had set him free. He was once blind, and now he saw. I mean, think about that. That's, that's what salvation is. To realize that you could not do anything to save yourself. So God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for your sins, that whosoever will believe in Jesus will not perish eternally, but instead have eternal life. And then you go out and proclaim that. You don't have to know all these apologetics. You don't have to have all these Bible verses memorized. You just need to tell them who Jesus is to you. That childlike faith. So I had to ask myself again, am I being an obedient disciple or am I being distracted by the pigs in this world? <laughs> the things that I think are important, but they're not. They're filthy. Do I need to be clean so that I can become more obedient? Do I need to cast out other loves so that I love more? Is there anything that I'm holding on to more than I'm holding on to Jesus? Mark 7, verse 31 and 32, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought, him to, brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. Why did I just read this scripture? This is from Mark 7. It has nothing to do with where we're at in the Scripture. But did you catch that? Jesus left Tyre and Sidon. He's visiting all these places teaching down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. That's where the man went to the ten cities to be a witness. And when Jesus left that side of the lake, they begged Jesus not to come back around. We saw what happened to this man. We saw the miracle that you did. But we don't want any part of you. 
Because we don't know what to do with this kind of ministry. We want our income from our pigs. We don't want to be set free. Whatever the reasons are, they beg Jesus to leave. But now, in Mark chapter 7, later on in Jesus' ministry, they, Jesus goes back to the same region and they beg Jesus to lay his hand on him. Because one man went to ten cities and spread the gospel message and said, I was blind and now I see. I was demon possessed and now I'm not. And the town knows about it. They profess about it. This is a true miracle you cannot deny. And I am the proof. Just like that man with his parents was brought in and said, uh, We don't know how our son can see or anything. Ask him. <laughs> You're the witness. Are you being a witness? Are you being a light in this world? That you were blind and now you see. Because that one man made a difference. I wonder if the disciples know this in Luke chapter 9, if they've got this message already when they go out on this other side of the lake. Because see, that other side of the lake where we don't want to go, where we're scared to go sometimes is, is more acceptable to the Word because on this side of the lake, again, we are comfortable with Jesus. We're comfortable just being around Jesus, being close to Him. And maybe if we touch His, clo His cloak, we can be cured without even in secrecy, without going to become a follower. That's where we're getting at in this Scripture where the woman does that. And this demonic activity was still waging on that other side of the lake. And it was waging on this side of the lake too. It was just waging in our complacency and who we are. And I'm saved and I know it so I can sit here and be okay without denying myself taking up my cross and following after Jesus. So we're back on the comfortable side of the lake. And I'm going back to Mark chapter 5 because I'm going to read you the different accounts from the different Gospels. Mark chapter 5, verse 21, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. These crowds are growing in capacity because Jesus is popular. But who is Jesus? That's the question again. Who is this man? Will you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus? Or will you just want to be associated with him? Or if you're religious, you just want to have controversy with him. Why are you carrying on the Sabbath? A large crowd was gathered around him while he was by the lake. He did not even get away from the lake, and they already were hoarding him. As soon as he stepped off the boat, they were looking for him. Here he comes! Not to be cured, but just to see what's going on. There are some there that, that want Jesus for what they need for him to do for him. In fact, verse 22 says, the, Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus, Kind of strange, a synagogue leader, because that would seem like that would be controversy rather than, than not. He came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet in an act of worship. Verse 23, he pleaded earnestly with him. We, we put begging in there, because last week I said there was a lot of begging going on. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come put her hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. You ask, Jesus does. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was, was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd, touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she, she felt, in her, felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone from out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. So now we see this woman coming and falling at Jesus' feet in an act of worship. She is trembling with fear, just as they did in the boat and everything, and she confesses the truth to, to Jesus. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. 
Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion while people cr with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all the commotion and wailing? This child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he, after he put all of them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in here with the child, where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders, do not tell anyone about this, and told them to give her something to eat. Now Mark's count's pretty extensive. Matthew's is not so much. We'll look at it in a second. But there's information here in Mark's. It's not in Luke's. And we'll go over it a little bit, and I'll tell you more as we get into Luke's. But like I said, as soon as Jesus stepped off the boat, there are crowds that welcome him rather than crowds that run him away. Now, I know the crowds weren't there immediately other because he was faced by the demon men first, but then the crowds later came and they told him to go away. Now there are great crowds on this side of the lake saying, come, come, we welcome you. But why? Why do you welcome? Do you want a Lord of your life or you just want a salvation pass? Or do you just want your needs, your prayers answered? Oh, prayer activity so much increases when a problem's in your life, does it not? The desire and the urgency is there because you need a need met. So you cry out to God. You, you see that in the world around you, period, when something comes. Pray to God! Were you not praying to Him yesterday? Were you not living as you should have lived yesterday? And like I said, here's a synagogue leader, one of the synagogue leaders, that you would have thought would have been in confrontation, but he's not because... Now he's begging Jesus because he's desperate. Oh, I entitled this Still Begging, but I subtitled it called Desperate for Jesus. Because there comes a point in your life when you beg, you beg, you beg, Jesus to answer your prayers, but then you become desperate. And that happens in the lives of Christians and probably in most non-Christians as well. Because this comes and you realize that this comes in your life. I thought I could deal with this other... I thought I could deal with the cancer in my life, but I can't face it when it's my only daughter dying. I can't face it anymore. I've got to come to the creator of all things and say, hey, how can we solve this problem? But when you accept Jesus Christ, do you accept Him as Lord? If you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, it does not say Savior there. It says Lord and is He Lord of all? And do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and not love others? I mean, other things. And do you love others as much as you love yourself? And are you willing to give up your life to save them? Do you understand the gospel message, the keys to the kingdom, the marvelous mysteries that you've been given to understand? Do you understand the parables, the further teachings that teach you to be like Jesus in this world? And he says, "Put, come put your hands on her. Well, we've seen some different things where Jesus spoke. We saw some things where he puts his hands on her. Okay, we've got healing power if Jesus touches. We understand Jerry understands this. This is the first time when we see the woman coming up that, that we see someone else just says, if I just touch, and we don't even have to touch Jesus, we can just touch his robe. So we're seeing some differences here in, in how healing comes, but what your point that you're seeing here is a desperation leading to faith or lack of faith, depending on how you accept what Jesus does for you. Because Jesus is going to do the miracle. It's a matter of whether you believe and truly it changes your life or you don't just say, okay, that got taken care of. Now we'll go back to our life the way it was. There was such a large crowd that they were pressing upon Jesus so hard that the disciples asked, how in the world could you think someone touched you? And Jesus doesn't say, someone touched me here. He says, someone just touched my cloak. Now, I don't know if she just grabbed a hold or just brushed up against it. But how did Jesus know that? Well, Jesus knew it because it says power came out of him. 
We haven't seen that in Scripture before. She thinks something and says it to herself, but Jesus doesn't comprehend necessarily what she's thinking. He has to ask, will she come forward and confess what she did or not? You didn't have to. The, the miracle had already happened, but Jesus calls us to come forward and to profess him. If she would have walked away, that, that believing in faith would have got her to that, but there would have been no acceptance of, of Jesus Christ as Lord again. And that's why I put that out. If she would not have come at his feet and worshiped and said everything, then she, the miracle would have happened because she did this or that out of faith, not because of the thing that was done, but would she follow? And we really don't know what happens with Jairus because the story ends and doesn't tell us that. We do learn from this scripture that it had been 12 years. We learn later as we read that the daughter was 12 years old also. We learn in this scripture that many doctors had tried to cure her. Luke doesn't mention that. I find that kind of funny because he's a physician, yet he doesn't mention that they spent all kind of money on physicians. I just think it's funny. <laughs> and that she'd spent all she had. So now she's broke. She has this problem and she's broke and it's got worse. Okay, now you've got to go back to the times and everything. If she was bleeding for 12 years, she was unclean for 12 years. So she was an outcast to society, an outcast to her family. All right, let's take it into the personal relationship even. She was unclean to her husband if she was married. She couldn't be around her husband for 12 years. So he had probably given her a writ of divorce. Wouldn't you think that's a legitimate reason if you want to go back to the law? So she was an outcast from all society. She shouldn't have been out there in public, so she's probably disguised herself or some way because if she would have been out in public and touched someone else, and there's no way she couldn't have touched someone else if the crowds are that great. And now she's going to go out and, oh, if I don't touch Jesus, maybe I can touch his garment, but that would make the garment unclean, which would make Jesus unclean. It's just an audacious, audacious act of faith to go out and do this, but it's also self, so, so self-centered in everything because you're making everyone else clean. But you're desperate for Jesus at this point that you'll do whatever you got to do in faith that there'll be a miracle that will happen. Where she touched on his cloak would have been the tassels. If you go back into Old Testament, you can learn more about the bleeding and the uncleanness, but you also learn about the tassel, and those tassels are to remind us who God is, to remind us of his laws and our need for him and everything. And immediately when she did, when she touched him, she was freed from her suffering, and that power had gone out from Jesus. We don't see this in any other part of Scripture that I know of. But Je I, I, don't, I don't comprehend it per se either. But Jesus felt power of the Holy Spirit come out of him in healing. And I contemplate that. And I hope you contemplate that. What does that look like in your life? Because the same power that was hovering over the waters, the same power that walked with Jesus, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you that power transforming you and changing you. So what does it feel like if you're really obedient to the Spirit and, you, and something happens? Can you feel the Spirit moving inside of you? I say you should be able to. And he asked, who touched my clothes? Well, of course, this is an... A, a teaching moment for the disciples again, and we learn later that Peter speaks up, which doesn't surprise us. But they asked, who t how can you ask who touched me? There's so many people here, how can you ask that? And let's go back. Why, where are we at in this story? Huge crowds. Jarius somehow manages to get through all the crowd because he has some faith. He manages to get through all of the crowd and get to Jesus to ask him, hey, can you come and heal my daughter? She's dying. So by faith... He gets to Jesus. Jesus says, sure, let's go. But he gets interrupted along the way. He gets interrupted by something that's not as important. I understand this woman has been, but no one knows this at this time till it's done. He doesn't know why Jesus stops and says, who touched me? But even when he realizes what happens, he still doesn't care probably. I'll put the probably in there. Because my concern is going to be on my daughter who's dying. 
Why did we stop here? And even if you felt power coming out of you, and even if there was a miracle here, this is not as important as my need right now because I'm desperate for Jesus, and I want that to happen now. But the problem is, is it doesn't always happen now, does it? And it didn't happen now in Jairus' story. But it did happen, didn't it? And Jairus got to see it. And his wife got to see it. And three of the disciples got to see it. But you've got to remember that your prayers are going to be answered in God's timing. So that takes me to all kind of scripture that tells me to keep asking, to keep knocking, to pray so much that it's aggravating, we'll use that word, that the woman keeps going back and back and gets justice. To keep praying persistently like that. <clears throat> Jesus took time to look around and ask till the woman came up and confessed and told him the whole truth. How long did that take? Twelve years worth of truth bottled up. Come on, women. If you've got twelve years worth of truth, how long will you be talking? There's some husbands here. Mark, how long will Teresa be talking with twelve years of bottled up truth? She'll be talking a while. And all this time, Jairus is back here, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. And as we learn in Scripture more, when this is going on, someone comes up and says, don't bother the teacher anymore, your daughter died. Wow. I mean, I got compassion for the woman and everything, but Jesus, I need you to act now for me. This is my only daughter. She's entering adulthood. We find out that she's 12. She's going to be my lineage, my heritage from the Lord. Why are you dallying here in this way? And then we read on, and she tells her daughter, you are a child of God. You belong. You're clean. Your faith has healed you. You acted based on a belief. You acted out and trust and believed, and you have faith, have faith has healed you. So now you can go in peace and be freed from your suffering, all the sufferings that you had that are related to that. But while Jesus was still speaking, here came that message, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Well, you know, Jesus teaches us to bother him, to come consistently, like I said, with our prayers and everything else, to ask and it will be given unto you, to have faith and you can say to the mountain to be cast in the sea and it will be done so. You can ask for have your faith increased. What's Jesus' answer? Overhearing what they said, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. Okay? Believe is the verb. Faith is the noun. Same root. If you believe, then you've got to have faith. Faith without works is dead. So if I believe, what do I need to do? I need to continue on with my journey with Jesus and go see my dead daughter. So at least we can mourn together. At least I can thank God for the 12 years I had with her. And maybe in this case, I can thank God for seeing new life restored back into her. Don't be afraid, just believe. So he lets Peter, James, and John go. They get there and they see such a commotion. The reason there's a commotion, you have to understand that from the times again, is there are people paid to be there to wail and mourn, like we saw the procession with the woman with her only son. And so they're there wailing and mourning, and then she dies, and they wail and mourn even louder. But they're only there because they're getting paid. They don't care. They don't have compassion. They don't believe in Jesus because... Jesus says, why all the commotion? The child is not dead but asleep, and they laughed at him. Well, this is going to spread the gospel message even though they laughed at him because they're going to go tell everybody from this point on, even though he tells the, the parents and the disciples to be quiet at this point, they're going to go tell everybody because they're going to say, he said he wasn't dead, but I know that girl was dead. Her spirit had left her body, but they didn't let her, he didn't let them see the miracle because of their lack of unbelief. So he goes in with just the, the, the five that we know of, took her by the hand and tells her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Little girl, as in my daughter, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. Who is this Jesus? 
this man who commands the dead and they rise again. Who is this Jesus to me? Jairus standing there, the mother there, to Peter, James, and John. And he gives strict orders to them not to tell, her, tell anybody, but instead he has compassion on the little girl and says, man, this was probably rough. Give her something to eat. She's got to be hungry. She's back to full life, period. Take care of her immediate needs, which is give her something to eat, then go outside and play. It's such a wonderful story. So let's look at Matthew's. His account's not as in-depth, and then we'll go into Luke and see a couple differences. Matthew 9, verse 18. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died. Well, now we know more in the story that was leading up to this. That's why I put Mark there. But come and put your hand on her and she will live. Now that's strange because we didn't see that at all in the other story, but we know that the gospel message, messages are congruent with each other, that there's, there's no uh, problems there. So it must have been during this story when Jesus said, just don't be afraid, just believe, that he said after that, well then come and put my hand on her and she'll live. This increasing faith. I know, I know who you are. Maybe I know about this story of that w woman with her son. I, I don't know why. Maybe the God gave me the faith at that point to continue on the mission because faith is a gift from God. But whatever it is, he says, come put your hand on her and she will live. So that's been added to this story. Jesus got up, went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. We see edge of the cloak there. She had said to herself, if I only touch the cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned to her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and, and people playing pipes, that's another reason we know it's a professional crowd, he said, go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread throughout all the region, because you know they're going to go say this girl was dead. Matthew's account doesn't give us much other than that, that part put in there about, I got enough faith that if you'll just come, she'll live, even though she's dead. So now let's look at Luke's. And the reason I go... Do those first and go to Luke, as Luke has wrote this orderly account, so you'll know that what you believe, so that you will live as though you know what you've been taught and believed. He is a physician that has, been, that has given up his life to follow after Jesus, to write this gospel message, to be a companion of Paul, to travel around the world. He is not living for money or prestige or anything else. He's living for the gospel message. And he's a Greek that wants us to understand fully what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Luke 8, verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him as the a direct opposition. They wanted to be there for they were expecting him. So let's ask you this again. Are you a fan or a follower? Because the crowds were definitely fans of Jesus, not followers of Jesus. And you're either a fan or a follower or you're not. <laughs> you're not any of those. There's your three choices. So I'm saying right now you're here, so you're not the not. You're here. That still doesn't mean that you're a child of God by all means, but it means that you're at least associate yourself with Jesus. So you're a fan of Jesus or you're a follower of Jesus. So what is the difference? Look at the biblical standpoint. Look at what Luke is putting out here. Examine your own life. Do I look more like a fan of Jesus or do I look like a follower of Jesus? Because you look a lot different when you're a follower of Jesus. And that's what Luke is pointing out here. <clears throat> Are you learning from the teacher, your master, your Lord, what it means to follow Jesus, even through the storms, even through de demonic activity? Are you increasing your faith? Do you realize your life has been purchased, that it is wholly set apart to God for His service, and that is your reasonable act of worship? And you used to live for these things and live this way, and now you're a child of God living for His kingdom, and you identify yourself over here. Because anywhere else is a non-follower. Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote this in The Cost of Discipleship. 
The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give our, over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not a terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he builds him to come and die. You deny yourself, your desires, your wishes, your will, the things that you lived for before, take up your cross as an instrument of suffering and death, but to give you life because you're not dead at this point, but you've been given abundant life so that you can follow Jesus. The cross is a point of death and finality, but in our life it's a point of death and finality to the ways that you were so that you can live as a child of God. When Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him because they were expecting him, but they did not want a Lord or save a, a Lord. They did not want a master. They did not want a teacher. They did not want to become disciples as a general whole. Okay, so does this next person coming up, does he want to become a disciple? Then a man named Jairus, because you've got the crowd welcoming him and you've got an exception, a synagogue leader who shouldn't have been coming to Jesus but comes to Jesus because he is desperate. And his desperation leads to faith, faith that we can even see that says, I know you can raise my child from the dead. But we've got to be tossed around on that sea. We've got to have worries and discord, but we shouldn't because James tells us that we don't expect to, to get anything if, we're, if we have that kind of faith. A man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading him to come to his house. Here's that point where you meet Jesus in those troubled waters, whatever they are, and you have to say, who is Jesus to me? You might see the sea calmed, and you might walk away unchanged, or you might walk away a new creation in Christ. It all depends on what you believe. Why did he do this? Verse 42. He did this because his only daughter, we learn that it's his only child, only daughter here. A girl about 12 was dying. And of course we read before where we learned that she does die. Out of desperation, he fell into an act of worship. He came based on a response of his belief, which led to faith, called him to do this. He did it because... I can't do anything for my daughter. So I'm going to ask Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He does. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. Now we get a little more uh, feeling for how intense these crowds were, that they almost crushed him because they wanted to be associated with Jesus. Boy, if we just had that kind of zeal in the church, even get the doors packed, but if they're not disciples, does it really matter? They wanted to be associated with Jesus so much to see a miracle, to have something done, whatever it was. But remember, when the feeding of the 5,000 comes in the next chapter, they don't want any part of the bread of life. Jairus has been contemplating who Jesus is, everything that he's heard and about him and everything, but it took this moment of desperation to make him act in faith. And as he's going along, there's an interruption. I made my request to the Lord, but then there's this interruption. All right, I've got to stop and think how many times that's happened to me. When I prayed and prayed and prayed about this, and it's got more urgent, and I prayed and prayed about this, but then there was this. I thought we were focused on this, God. Do I not have enough faith that the interruptions are okay too? <clears throat> A woman was there, verse 43, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, the same amount of time as the, the girl had been alive. This girl had been dead in this world. Same amount of time. 
Because as I explained earlier, she could not associate even with her husband and if she had one and probably was not married anymore. She couldn't come out in public, anything else. So this is an audacious move of faith on her part more than the synagogue leader. Because if Jesus wouldn't go, the synagogue leader doesn't have that much to lose. I mean, he does as far as his daughter, but I mean, it, it, the answer can be yes or no. This woman coming up, if she gets exposed at all, they're going to stone her next for, for defiling the whole town. But what, is, what does it matter to her? Life was over anyway. She was, she was dead. <clears throat> but in Jairus' eyes, this woman's not dying. This is not as important as my need. But no one could heal her. She had exasperated everything. We found her money and everything else and was only getting worse and no one could heal her. So in her moment of desperation again, she acts in faith. Verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. I told you that was the tassel or the fringe. And you can go to Numbers 15 and read, These will serve as tassels for you to look at so that you may remember all the commandments of the Lord and that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by following your own heart and your own eyes. Then you will remember and obey all my commandments and you will be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. But she couldn't even worship God because she was unclean. So what were those tassels reminding her or when she seen the rabbis walk by and when, when she saw Jesus? So she reached out and touched, and immediately her bleeding stopped. She didn't ask Jesus. She was desperate and act in faith in a strange and peculiar way, touching his garment at this point, and she was healed. She never asked permission, anything else. She just knew who Jesus was and went out and did it. Verse 45, who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Well, we expect that at that part because we expect Peter to come up and put his foot in his mouth, so to speak. There's so many people here. How can you say someone touched you? And why would that even matter right now, Jesus? And they all denied it. Okay, the crowds were pressing so much that they almost crushed Jesus. Who touched Jesus? A bunch of people. But I didn't touch Jesus because I'm not getting in trouble. <laughs> I, I, I got some common sense here, some fear of God, whatever it is. I don't know who Jesus is yet. I certainly don't know who he is to me, but I don't want to be the one caught touching Jesus because I don't want to be in trouble. What did the woman think? Because she's got to either expose herself or walk away as a secret disciple. If you confess with your mouth after you believe in your heart. She had to make that confession. But Jesus said, he kept on insisting, it didn't stop there, someone touched me. <laughs> I know that because power has gone out from me. Now the other people wouldn't necessarily know what she's meant here because we haven't seen it in scripture at this point, but she knew because she felt that healing power and immediately she was healed. You don't know you stop bleeding. How do you know that again? You look, you pull the Band-Aid off later and see if the blood is coagulated and everything. She knew immediately because she felt that power just as Jesus felt that power come out of him. So now is the point. I've got to either deny or confess. I came believing. I did an act of faith. So what did she do? She came trembling and fell at his feet because she had no idea if she'd be accepted or denied, what the crowds would do and everything, and she had to admit everything at that point that the crowds heard about what she did. And you know their first point was, how dare she do this? That's exactly what they said when the pigs came out. How dare this happen to this man? We don't care about him. But she came trembling and fell at his feet in an act of worship. And look how Luke puts this in here because he is particular with things he says like this. In the presence of all the people. There is no denying Jesus now. She can't just go back to the way she was. She's got to be like this man on the other side of the lake. She's either got to be a witness or she's got to deny Jesus. 
There is that point that has come, that aha moment where you realize who Jesus Christ is, where the light bulb turns on, but what do you do with it? She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. She gave her testimony, just like the man on the other side of the lake. I once was, and now I am, and it's all because of Jesus. What's Jesus' answer in verse 48? Then he said to her, Daughter, <laughs> you're a child of the kingdom of heaven. You're clean. Your faith has healed you. You put your faith into action, and now you can go in peace. Wait a minute. I don't know if I can go in peace or not because I don't know how the crowd's going to accept me or anything. I don't care how the crowd accepts me. I'm at peace with God. I'm in right standing. I am blessed. I don't care if they stone me down the road going back because of what I did. I'm at peace with God. I am His daughter. And Jairus is thinking, hurry up, Jesus. <laughs> More than likely. If she would have acted in a believing faith but denied, would she have been able to go in peace? Would she have heard those words? Would she have heard daughter? She'd have been healed of her disease. But she would have walked away from Jesus, the bread of life. Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Did you catch that? Believe that you have already received it, and it will be yours. That's the kind of belief that you have. James 1, verse 6 to 8, But he must ask in faith without doubting, because he who doubts is like a wave on, on the, of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. Verse 49, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. What's the crowd's uh, point of view or the servant's point of view or uh, an, whoever it is, servant, whatever? Don't bother the teacher anymore. Why not? Isn't God big enough for all of your problems? Doesn't God care? Hasn't Luke already set this up in his gospel to this point? And, and Luke starts calling Jesus Lord because he's putting that point across again. But the advice he gets from others is don't bother Jesus anymore. But Jesus tells us to bother him. Luke chapter 11, verse 5, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you goes to his friend at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine has come to me on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't, Do not bother me. My door is already shut and my children are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up to provide for him because of his friendship, yet because of this man's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. What father among you, if a son asks for fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Those words hadn't been penned yet in this story of Luke's gospel. But Jerish could have turned at that point and said, it's over. But he didn't. We know that he, all, that he said, if you just come, Lord, I know that she can live again. So what does Jesus say to their, their call for him to abandon his faith? Verse 50, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. Don't believe, Alan. Keep asking persistently in prayer. You know that I care. You know that I can. You know that I will answer in my way, in my time. Believe it and don't be distracted by other things. Verse 51, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the children of the father and mother. Because he's teaching them, who am I to you? And we, we learn from Scripture as we lead on, you know, Peter will become the, the leader of the, the disciples. John will live the longest and, and 
be an elder in the church after Peter's gone. But, you know, James is the first one to be martyred soon after. Why? God's way, God's timing. I don't know. I got no idea. But he calls you to follow him, and you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow him. So they're in the room with Jesus, wondering who this man named Jesus is. Verse 52, Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. They were professional mourners. They weren't there for any other reason. But they knew that she was dead. Even though they did not believe, they would go on to profess the gospel message just like the uh, crowds would on the other side of the lake. Verse 54, But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. My child. Not just little girl, not daughter, but my child, get up. Saying that he was equal with God, that you are part of the family of God because I have compassion for you and I want you to live. Verse 55, her spirit returned. It had left her body. She was dead. There was no questions about it. And at once she stood up. Now, I understand the wind and waves on the sea, and that would freak me out. <laughs> but here I am in this room with Jesus. It's time. It's personal. And Jesus tells the little girl to get up. And at once she stood up. Who is this Jesus? He's the King of kings, Lord of lords. Is he my King of kings? Is he my Lord of lords? Am I following him, or am I just a fan of his? Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. I love how that ends because it's just like I said, we're back to normal day-to-day -day business. I have come and interceded from heaven. I've came from heaven and died for your sins. Now it's back to normal day-to-day. -day. Eat, but will you really eat of the bread of life that gives eternal life? Will you really go out and profess? Will you live a different life? Will you get yourself off the throne and put God on the throne? Because you are a child, you are a daughter of the kingdom of heaven, a son of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 56, her, pa her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Complete opposite on the other side. He didn't need their testimony at this point, just like he didn't need the demon's testimony at this point. But the time would come when they would need to testify, would they? Or would they not? Would they live differently? Or would they have just had an encounter with Jesus and walked away? Later in Luke, we were going to read these words also. Luke eleven twenty three: 23, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And look at Jesus' next words very clear, carefully. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it passes through places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. And on return, it finds a house swept and clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and dwell there. And the final plight of that man is worse than the first. Well, we didn't have the demon activity on this side. Why are you saying that, Jesus? Well, we know that we fight a spiritual battle. You know that this demonic activity had been waging this woman's mind because she had been sitting there hearing whispers from Satan and his dominions and his minions that you're not good enough. God doesn't love you. He had been hearing from, from on Jairus' point, this can't be the Son of God. He, he does these things on the Sabbath and everything. You don't think that's going to be whispers in their ears when they walk away? You, haven't you heard those whispers before too? But do you believe the lies or do you believe the truth? We turn the page in our Bible or turn to the next chapter and we read these words which Mark read to us. When Jesus had called the twelve together, so this is the next thing that Luke records after this, he calls the twelve, the three were there. We don't know what happened to the woman or to Jairus. He gave them power and authority to drive out demons and cure all diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Just take the gospel message. They left Jesus. They went out on their own because they had been taught and trained to be a disciple. They went out with power and authority, just like you've been given power and authority to preach the gospel message, to be a light to this world. 
Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. All you need is the gospel. Verse 6, so they went out and went from village to village preaching the gospel and people heal, and healing people everywhere. So there's where you are in the story of Luke so far. You've been sent out if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. It may be into your home for your mission field. It may be in your work. It may be across the seas, wherever it's at. Are you going with the power of the gospel message? Are you, are you ashamed? Do you deny the truth? For the gospel message is the power of salvation. And I am not ashamed of the gospel message because I know that. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word, for the Holy Spirit that you have given us to be your ambassadors, to be empowered. As we read through Luke's gospel and as we study in our whatever Bible studies and through our devotions and things that we're reading, Lord, increase our faith. Empower us with your spirit to walk in the spirit. Lord, help us to be the kind of people that you've called us to be, to not be ashamed, to not worry about the things of this world, to be compassionate for others, not to be distracted by the things, but, Lord, just to believe and to act in faith. And where our faith is shaky, Lord, Lord, give us more faith. Help us to be consistent in our prayers, knowing that our prayers will be answered in your time, in your way, knowing that if we love our children and give them good gifts how much more you will be if we are persistently following Jesus Christ, giving up our lives, denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following after Jesus. We thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you, that we're not in a period of persecution for doing that, Lord. And we pray for if the day comes that we are, Lord, that you'll give us the faith to withstand all the fiery darts of the devil then as well, Father. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the fellowship that we have with the Spirit. Lord, we just praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.